next from Illinois College in Jacksonville. Former Congressman Lee Hamilton, who also served as the vice chair of the 9-11 Commission, delivers a speech entitled, Advice for the Next President. A former Democratic congressman from Indiana, Mr. Hamilton served 34 years in the U.S. House of Representatives and is considered an expert on foreign affairs. This runs about 45 minutes. Good afternoon to all of you, and let me begin by saying that a few years ago we had in the House of Representatives a speaker by the name of John McCormick. John McCormick was a great debater, and uh, every now and then he would want to leave the speaker's chair and, as we say, come onto the floor of the house and into the well. And in the course of the debate, someone on the other side of the aisle would invariably irritate him. And he'd turn to that person and say, I hold the gentleman from Iowa in minimum high regard. <laughs> I want you to know because of your association with Illinois College, I hold each of you here today in maximum high regard. And it has been a very high privilege for me uh, to visit this campus even for a few hours. Indeed, when I leave the positions that I now hold, uh, President Storier, it may very well be I'll want to submit an application to become a student here. <laughs> uh, I'm not at all sure my grade point average would be high enough, but maybe you'd give me a break. <laughs> I want to say also what a high pleasure it is for me to be with Paul Finley. I told a group uh, a moment ago of the Phi Alpha Literary uh, Society that one of these days I'm going to set up a Hall of Fame for public servants. We have them now for baseball players and guitar players. We ought to have them for public servants. And on the very first ballot, I would put into that Hall of Fame Paul Finley because of his remarkable service in representing this congressional district because of the kind of person he is. And my greatest recollection of Paul is always his insistence to try to find a solution to a problem in a very constructive way. And I want Paul to know how deeply I have appreciated his friendship and Lucille, his wife, over a period of years. Now, I happened to notice uh, two or three times here that people said I'd been in the Congress for 34 years. I'll tell you a story about that. I made a pretty bad mistake when I announced my retirement. I said that I'd been in the Congress for 34 years, and I had cast over 16,000 votes. And I went back to my office. I had a telephone call, and constituent said, Lee, I understand you announced your retirement today. I said, yes. He said, I understand you cast over 16,000 votes. I said, yes. He said, I want you to know you finally made a decision I agree with. <laughs> and that, of course, is why I like these nice introductions. Uh, I had a lot of fun in the United States Congress, and one of the things I did was keep track of various uh, sayings that impressed me, and I want to repeat for you the all-time best bumper sticker. This is not quite rise to an academic level, but I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> we had some years ago a Catholic priest in the house. His name was Father Robert Drinan. My understanding today is a Catholic priest cannot be elected to Congress, but he was then. And his bumper sticker was very simple. It said, vote for Father Drinan or go to hell. <laughs> I never had that kind of courage myself. Uh, and uh, Paul Finney and I debated the Middle East practically every other week in the Congress, and maybe he remembers when one of the members got up and said, uh, talking about the Middle East and all of the conflicts there, he said, I don't see why the Arabs and the Israelis cannot settle this thing, just like good Christians ought to. And since we're in Lincoln country, I will say that one of the members got up one time and said if Abraham Lincoln were alive today, he'd be turning over in his grave. <laughs> and during a debate on trade, another member got up. He got his metaphors mixed up a little bit, and he said, 
If we don't stop sharing the sheep that lays the golden egg, we'll pump it dry. (laughs) I was uh, campaigning one day, and a fellow came up to me and he said, uh, Did anyone ever tell you you look like uh, Lee Hamilton? I was getting ready to respond, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, and the fellow said, "Uh, doesn't that really piss you off? (laughs) I guess it's appropriate for me to start something serious here. Let me begin with this observation. But after the next president of the United States walks down Pennsylvania Avenue after the inauguration, he or she will step into the Oval Office and he or she will find new and profound challenges for the United States lurking around every corner. And if they do not already know, and I suspect they do, They will see a world that confronts them with very difficult, complex, and dangerous challenges. It's about as long a list of unfinished business as I can ever remember a president meeting when they step into that Oval Office. I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail here. You you know the problems, Iraq. How do we get out of Iraq responsibly? meeting our obligations. Afghanistan, the present situation is very grim. To put it mildly, the prospect of failure is rising. Iran, we have a regime that we think at least is pursuing nuclear weapons. How do we enter into a dialogue with Iran today? One of the great challenges before us. In a few days, a new president will step into power in Russia. We're confronted with an altogether different situation there. Two men in charge. We don't really know at this point who's going to have the power. The country has been moving away from democracy, even as its confidence has been rising. Pakistan, where we are fearful that an Islamic radical group could get hold of the nuclear weapon and then we would be confronted with the greatest of all horrors, the possibility of terrorists having that weapon. 